Lou Alstead, their next speaker, spent 31 years working in the oil and gas industry. He was executive vice president of Mobile Oil Corporation, responsible for exploration and production, drilling for oil and gas in the US, Canada, and Latin America. Previously, he headed Mobile's worldwide, world, worldwide supply, trading, and transportation operations. He's a member of the Board of US Oil and Gas Association, former or current? Former member, and that's why he's here tonight, Lou. Thank you. Tony and I have taken slightly different approaches. He hit two points. I'm going to hit a number of them. Um, and to start with, I'm going to talk about what I didn't find in the GEIS. After reading through it, it occurred to me that there are several things that are missing. We'll go through these in more detail, but nothing on cumulative impacts, no control of the pace of drilling, and no integration of a lot of other things with the recommendations, and no regulations. Cumulative impacts. Um, this is a very hard thing to do. We don't have a whole lot of experience with high volume fracking. Um, a few years at most, and so the, it's almost impossible to do it, but it's supposed to be done. Um, what the GIS does is basically propose mitigation that r usually relates to a single occurrence of an individual impact. It doesn't think about what a mitigation would be if you had to deal with multiple versions of that same impact or with different impacts, multiple versions of different impacts. Um, there's no discussion of how all of these impacts interact with each other, either immediately or over a long period of time. So it's, I think that's a major failing. Uh, the review is really incomplete. Um, the small numbers are the citations in the document if you ever want to go and look at the individual pieces. But what isn't in there right now is the transportation in infrastructure impacts, socioeconomic impacts, visual noise, roads, community character, and nothing related to pipelines, gas processing plants, or compression stations, which are all under the PSC jurisdiction. So to do a thorough job, they would have had to have known what these impacts were because before they could design appropriate mitigation measures. And they simply don't have it because it's, <clears throat> it's not in there yet. The DEC treats each well um, as a separate permit, and it doesn't consider what else is going on. Um, so a well or a well pad extended from that well is all it considers. Um, you could significantly mitigate the intensity of some of these impacts if you time staged when they were occurring and where they're occurring. And basically, the DEC rejects the whole idea of regulating the pace of drilling. They are taking whatever the industry gives to them. They're not trying to control it. And they say as much in the document. Um, <clears throat> they really don't consider what a local community can absorb. So they will just look at this well permit coming in and permit it and the next one coming in, not considering that they're piling 100 wells on one community and maybe a compression station and a treatment plant and a lot of pipelines all at the same time. There are no regulations. Tony talked about this, but this document is not the regulations they propose to start permitting as soon as the GEIS is issued and then do the regulations. <laughs> um, the 1992 GEIS was published in a similar way and we still don't have the regulations. So waiting for the regulations doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They should be in place before the permits are issued. Now let's talk about some of the specifics. Fracking fluids, some good things, some not so good. Um, they are requiring material data sheets. Uh, they have quite a bit better control of the fluids at the well pads. They have to be in enclosed containers within a secondary containment area. Uh, they also 
require the driller to consider alternative fracking fluids, less risky flu uh, fracking fluids, unless they are not equally effective or feasible in the determination of the DEC. And the DEC really needs to push this harder. There are better fluids out there. There will be over time, but they won't be there unless the DEC and other government, state governments push. <clears throat> Treatment of flowback water. Um, one good thing is that they require uh, a, a, uh, the driller to have a place to take the flowback water before they will issue a permit. And in some cases, they require a backup location. Uh, a significant problem that they go into some detail is that municipal plants don't have enough capacity. They estimated that a typical plant that has some spare capacity might be able to handle the treatment from one well pad. Now, we've got something like 30 of these plants around, 30 well pads that's nowhere near going to cover the wells. They talk about private plants, but nothing in specifics. Uh, somebody would have to build them, and they're not there yet. Injection wells require secret process, full-blown evaluation. They don't go into detail, but there haven't been any approved wells in a long time in New York State. Um, the material has to be, is, they are allowing the material to be treated, transported as commercial waste. These same chemicals come to the site as hazardous waste, go down in the ground, come up with additional noxious things, and then they get transported off as commercial. That shouldn't be done that way. They should be treated as hazardous waste. They have proposed a transportation a tracking system, which sounded good in the initial announcement but it's self-reporting. <laughs> Open pits. <clears throat> this was a big concern the last go-round. They have done the right thing on part of it. They've prohibited for frac fluids and flowback fluids. Those have to be in closed containers and, and secondary containments. They allow open pits for fresh water, the water that would go into fracking, which is not a particular problem. Um, but they allow, still allow open pits for some drilling waste. Now, drilling waste is what comes up during the drilling process. It actually contains chemicals that are similar to the fracking chemicals, plus the cuttings of, of the, uh, from the drill bore. And those really ought to be in contained systems, closed systems, and why they let this one go through, I don't know. It simply should be prohibited. The industry usually does it in, in closed systems. They can do it. There's no reason that it should, shouldn't be required. You probably have heard about New York City, Syracuse versus the rest of the state. You have to actually think about what that, those distances mean. For New York City, you start at the edge of the reservoir, go to the top of the watershed, and add 4,000 feet. Reservoir, top of the watershed, plus 4,000 feet. For everybody else in a municipal system that draws from lakes or reservoirs, you get 2,000 feet from the reservoir, but only 5, 500 feet from any tributary stream feeding that lake or reservoir, and only 500 feet from an aquifer that would feed that reservoir. So in effect, you really only get about 500 feet. The rationale is that Syracuse and New York have unfiltered systems. The problem with that rationale is that the chemicals are dissolved and are going to go through any filter anyhow. So the rest of the state is not protected by the filters that they're using to justify New York and Syracuse. A few of the other setback distances uh, you saw on the map earlier, 2,000 feet from municipal wells, uh, personal wells 500 feet, not to mention about livestock or agricultural wells that I could find. Primary aquifers we talked about earlier, but the municipal wells and the aquifers will be reviewed and could those distances could be 
reduced in future years. Multi-well pads. Um, this is one of the things that they somewhat push in the documents. I think they should push them farther. There's far less surface disruption when you have multiple wells on one pad rather than a lot of them spread around. The industry is moving in that direction, and I think the DEC should give priority for multiple well pads over singles. Um, and if they do it, or when they do it, they should probably put some greater setbacks because the intensity in that one well pad is going to go on for a period of time, a longer period of time than a single well. The current staffing, and you've all heard the ridiculously no low numbers, they can't possibly handle a lot of additional workload. The DEC says that they will limit permits to what the staff can handle. Um, you know that when Senator XYZ calls up and says, my local driller needs this, the towns need the revenue, we've got to get a permit, got to get a permit, somebody's going to bend in that office and the permits are going to be issued beyond what they can handle. If, if that's how they're going to do it, then we ought to limit by law how many permits or wells the individual people at the DEC can handle. Uh, this is another thing that's missing. There are a few cases where they require uh, certification. The only place that they require certification is during the fracking period there has to be a certified uh, well control specialist on site. But there's no requirement for any checking of the background, skills, uh, uh, safety record of the people that are running the drill rigs or running the fracking. The guy who comes and drills your water well has to pass a test. These guys don't. Performance bonds. It's not mentioned in the guys, but if you go to that website, you'll find out that if you want to drill a well, you have to put up at most a $5,000 bond. <laughs> That's currently, and, and there's no mention of changing that. It really should be a really significant bond to uh, it does two things. One, it makes the driller pay more attention. Two, the bonding companies that supply the bonds will pay a lot more attention to who they uh, give the bonds to. Uh, this is a chart I've used before. An ideal level of safety at the top. Best companies have moved up, in my opinion, a, a few notches in the couple of years that we've been working on this. Uh, they're moving toward closed systems and moving toward reprocessing some of the waste. Um, things like that. They are actually looking for and using some better fracking fluids or less bad fracking fluids. Uh, the current regulations have probably moved up a notch. I'll give the DEC a little credit for moving them up a notch, but nowhere near enough. The worst companies, you may have seen some reports today of, of a company that was cited in Pennsylvania. The worst companies are flaunting the regulations, and they're flaunting them in part because the enforcement is weak. You can't make all of this work unless you get the regulations up and get the enforcement up. So these slides will be available, uh, I guess, on the website that was given before and also on the Atsego 2000 website uh, starting in the next day or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lou. And if anybody wonders whether the DC, DEC can resist pressure, I would point out that they had told us all that the regulations would be issued in late summer, early fall, until Governor Cuomo finished with the legislative session, and then it was determined they were coming out July 1st, no matter what. Uh, and that's probably why the second piece of it's not coming out till. Uh, late August, late July, but uh, I think we should be uh, prepared. We should be aware that that's what happens in Albany. Uh, 